what does this airplane, this airplane, and this airplane all have in common? You are not going to believe it, but we're going to tell you on Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. By request, special thanks to my good friend Max of Max's Models, the best model channel on YouTube. If you haven't seen it before, check it out. What these three diverse airplanes all have in common is that at one time or another in history, they all landed on an aircraft carrier. I know, hard to believe. Of course, the most famous would be the B-25s of uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle's Raiders. April 18th, 1942, they launched off the USS Hornet and became the first American warplanes to reach homeland Japan, uh, a initial turning point in the war in the Pacific. In 1950, two airplanes made their debut on carriers. One was an experiment seen here, a Lockheed P-2V Neptune using a JADO or RADO as you wish, uh, launch off the carrier USS Franklin D. Roosevelt, demonstrating the capability of a naval bomber to deliver a nuclear weapon to a distant target. Again, this was only for evaluation. But another airplane uh, which became operational with the Navy was the North American AJ Savage, seen here trapping aboard the USS Midway. By the jet age, uh, naval aviation had really come into its own. But we have to remember that it started with very humble beginnings. In uh, 1910, just if you can believe this, seven years after the Wright brothers' first flights at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, on November 14, 1910, a civilian pilot named Eugene Ely uh, launched a, a Curtis pusher from a ramp affixed to the cruiser USS Birmingham. Two months later, Ely flew a, a Curtis pusher D uh, and landed on a platform fixed to the USS Pennsylvania, January 18th, 1911. As carriers matured, uh, they actually began as cruiser hulls and then were converted into carriers in the initial uh, uh, 1930s and the years leading up to World War II. Here we see the USS Saratoga in the Ranger class, the USS Essex class carriers, the Midway class carriers, Coral Sea seen here, the Forrestal class carriers, first of the super carriers in the 1950s, uh, then the Nimitz class carriers that are primarily in use today, and the new to the fleet uh, USS Gerald Ford, uh, the Ford class carriers, uh, with the new Enterprise and the new Kennedy coming soon. But in the closing years of World War II, the Navy was seeking to expand their carrier capability, and they evaluated a number of unusual airplanes, again, as a uh, experimental evaluation basis. Three of those airplanes are seen here, the North American P-51, the North American PBJ, or Navy version of the B-25 Mitchell, and the Grumman F-7F Tiger Cat. So let's take a look at the carrier suitability trials for the P-51D, renamed Seahorse, for its Navy evaluation. On November 15, 1944, Navy test pilot Lieutenant Bob Elder made a series of traps and takeoffs from the USS Shangri-La in his P-51D. Here we see the uh, Mustang, or I should say Seahorse, on the deck. And Bob described this as an interesting uh, approach to putting an Army Air Force's airplane on a carrier. Here we see him making a takeoff. You see the humidity uh, uh, off the prop tips there. And notice that the tailwheel is just leaving the deck as he begins his takeoff roll. Well, what came of all this? It was decided that, uh, especially by that point in the war, there was no real need to try and integrate uh, Army Air Force's aircraft or unusual uh, non-operational aircraft into carrier usage. And another factor was that it was the very beginning of the jet age. And so just a year later, uh, Commander Eric Winkle Brown uh, flew a de Havilland Sea Vampire uh, landing aboard the HMS Ocean and taking off again on December 3rd, 1945, the first time that a jet airplane ever operated from an aircraft carrier. In the U.S., a year and a half later, Lieutenant Commander James Davison uh, flew a McDonnell XFD-1 Phantom from the USS Franklin D. Roosevelt. 
uh, made a series of five takeoffs and landings, becoming the first jet to operate from a U.S. carrier. And I should mention that pole that you see sticking up and aimed forward ahead of the windscreen was a protective device in case that the cables uh, somehow jumped up over the nose of the airplane and would impinge on the uh, on the windshield. But here we see a, 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 the first generation of carriers, the Korean War jets into the 1950s, the 1960s and into the Vietnam era, 1970s and up to today. And all these aircraft uh, represent naval aviation at its finest. But what was the largest, heaviest, and keyword here, operational carrier-based aircraft? Was it the Grumman C-2 Greyhound? Has a max gross takeoff weight of 60,000 pounds. Or the AJ Savage we saw earlier, 61,000 pounds. What about the North American A3J or RA5C Vigilante? 63,000 pounds. Well, then we jump up to the Grumman F-14 Tomcat, 74,000 pounds. But the largest, heaviest operational carrier-based aircraft is the Douglas A3D Sky Warrior. You didn't think I was going to do a video without a model box top, did you? Sky Warrior has a max gross takeoff weight, 82,000 pounds. Now, the largest aircraft to ever take off and land on a carrier is the Lockheed C-130 Hercules. And it, no, it wasn't the Blue Angels' Fat Albert, but I'm showing that airplane uh, mainly because it's a cool photo, but it is a Navy C-130F, and that was the same model that was used in carrier valuation uh, trials. Let's take a look. By the way, the uh, C-130 has 155,000-pound gross takeoff weight on land, uh, it was not operated at that weight for the carrier uh, trials. Now, here's the USS Forrestal. Uh, nice clean flight deck during its sea trials. But take a look at the proportions of this. Think of Navy jet fighters aboard this ship. What would they look like? And here's the C-130. They painted a stripe down the center of the uh, flight deck as a uh, runway guideline. And uh, on October and November of 63, uh, the Navy conducted these trials with a uh, C-130. Um, yeah, this is a great photo. It's Notice the name painted only on the right side of the airplane, so it could be viewed from the island of the carrier, of course. And that's Look Ma No Hook. But there it is. And uh, it was out there for, as I say, two months evaluation. Uh, let's take a look at the performance. It made 29 touch-and-go landings. 21 unarrested landings, 21 unassisted takeoffs. What do we mean by that? It did not have a tail hook. It didn't trap aboard the carrier, and it was not launched by catapult. You have to remember that a carrier can turn into the wind, so you've automatically got a nice uh, 25, 30, 40 knot uh, head start uh, as the aircraft makes its takeoff roll down the deck. Speaking of which, the uh, takeoff distance was only 743 feet, landing distance less than 300 feet, and the airplane operated at a gross weight of 85,000 pounds. Okay, we looked at the largest. Uh, what about the smallest airplane to land on a carrier? Well, during the evacuation of South Vietnam, uh, a uh, South Vietnam Air Force 01 or L-19 Cessna Bird Dog uh, was stolen, essentially, by a South Vietnamese uh, pilot. Uh, hot-wired the airplane and uh, loaded his uh, wife and five small children aboard and uh, circled the USS Midway, dropping notes to the uh, flight deck crew saying he wanted to land, and they had to actually push helicopters over the side. The L-19 landed aboard the carrier and was received, as you see here. Pretty gutsy. Uh, my friend Max also sent this photo of Piper L-4 Grasshoppers, uh, and I can't really call this a carrier, but it was a converted LST uh, for these special operations. Interesting photo. And finally, a carrier evaluation for probably the most unique airplane ever to uh, land and take off from a carrier, the Lockheed U-2. Now, I know what you're thinking. Doesn't the U-2 require a chase car to call out the critical altitudes? It's really the only way the airplane can uh, land successfully on a runway. So how do they do that in the Navy? Well, they have these guys, landing signal officers. And of course, they monitor the landing. And then there's the uh, Fresnel uh, mirror landing system, which guides the airplanes onto the deck. 
And so that's basically how it was done. Uh, operations uh, began with Operation Whale Tail aboard the USS Kitty Hawk. That's a U-2A, March 1964. And there were some problems. It was very dicey getting the airplane down in the allotted distance. Um, there was a uh, damage to the left wing on one of the landings. It just was not a successful uh, operation at that time. So what Lockheed did under the guidance of Kelly Johnson uh, was to reinforce the structure, redesign the tail hook, add spoilers to the airplane, much like a sailplane. And they went back and tried it again, this time on the USS Ranger with a U-2G unique uh, model airplane. And this solved the problem. Operation Fishhawk was actual operational missions flown in the Pacific in 1964. By 1969, the advanced U-2R was in operation, and they tried uh, adapting this to uh, flight deck operations with the USS America. This was Operation Blue Gull 5. And by now, uh, the system had matured to the point where the airplane could fly successfully uh, to and from the deck. Uh, the airplane had spoilers, and this particular airplane had folding wings to allow it to fit on the elevator of the uh, USS America. However, by this point, late 60s, early 70s, satellite surveillance technology had really come into its own. And uh, the other part was that the uh, U-2 was deemed uh, difficult to integrate into carrier operations with the rest of all the Navy airplanes. And so this program went by the wayside. So we look at Naval Carrier Aviation. It's really come far since the early days here we see a uh, Red Rippers Boeing F-4B-4 and the carrier USS Lexington. And we look at what uh, has happened in naval aviation today with the F-A-18 Super Hornet. And we realize this is what aviation progress is all about. So there you have it. A look at some of the unique airplanes that have operated from aircraft carriers, experimentally or otherwise. Fly Navy. As always, special thanks to the great people who make these uh, presentations possible, and uh, their support is very greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. We appreciate you watching these videos. We certainly enjoy bringing them to you. And if you haven't subscribed, we'd love to have you on board. Please do hit the like button on the way out. It does help us with YouTube. And until next time, take care.